picture this, you're standing in a Tokyo garage in 1991, watching Toyota engineers tear apart another blown engine, chunks of piston embedded in the cylinder wall, connecting rods bent like pretzels, the crankshaft literally snapped in half. This was prototype number 47 of what would become the 2JZ GTE, and it had just detonated at 8,000 RPM on the dyno. The engineers weren't discouraged, they were, they were learning exactly how much punishment their creation could take before it broke. What they discovered would create the most dangerous engine in automotive history. Not dangerous, because it was unreliable. Dangerous because it was virtually indestructible. Dangerous because it could handle four times its factory power output without opening the engine. Dangerous because it would democratize 1,000 horsepower streetcars and create an entire generation of speed addicts. This is the story of how Toyota accidentally built a monster that would terrorize highways from Tokyo to Texas, bankrupt more young enthusiasts than any engine before it, and become the beating heart of the most legendary street racing culture ever created. The 2JZ wasn't supposed to be a legend. Toyota designed it as a smooth, refined power plant for their luxury grand tourer, the Supra, they needed something to compete with the Nissan 300ZX's twin-turbo VG the 30D ETT and Mitsubishi's 3000 GT VR4. The market demanded 300 horsepower, smooth delivery, and bulletproof reliability for wealthy buyers who'd never see a racetrack. Toyota's engineers delivered all of that, but they also built in a safety margin that would make nuclear reactor designers jealous. To understand why the 2JC became so legendary, we need to travel back to Japan's bubble economy era. It's 1989, and Japanese manufacturers are locked in an engineering war that makes the space race look like a friendly competition. Nissan's working on the R32 GTR, Honda's developing the NSX, Mazda's perfecting the rotary-powered RX-7, and Toyota? They're pouring unlimited resources into creating the ultimate inline six. The development team led by chief engineer Isao Suzuki had one mandate, build an engine that would never embarrass Toyota. In Japanese corporate culture, reliability isn't just important, it's a matter of honor. Suzuki's team took this to extremes. Every component was overbuilt, every tolerance was tighter than necessary. Every material was one grade stronger than calculations required. Here's where it gets interesting. The 2JZ's foundation was a closed deck iron block. While competitors used aluminum for weight savings, Toyota chose iron for strength. The block featured seven main bearings instead of the typical four or five. The cylinder walls were 11 millimeters thick, nearly twice what most engines used. The deck surface where the head bolts on was reinforced with additional ribbing. This wasn't just strong, it was prepared for war. The bottom end was equally ridiculous. Toyota fitted forged steel connecting rods that could handle 800 horsepower in stock form. The crankshaft was forged steel, internally balanced, with counterweights so massive it looked like it belonged in a diesel truck. The pistons were hyper-eutectic aluminum with reinforced ringlands and oil squirters underneath for cooling. Main bearing caps were steel cross-bolted with additional side bolts for stability under extreme loads. The cylinder head was an aluminum dual overhead cam design with four valves per cylinder. Nothing revolutionary there, but Toyota used bucket-type valve lifters instead of rocker arms for better high RPM stability. The cam profiles were conservative, designed for smooth power delivery, not peak numbers. The head gasket was a multi-layer steel design, 1.2 millimeter thick, capable of sealing against cylinder pressures that would destroy most engines. Now here's the kicker. The 2 Diary Z GTE, the twin turbo variant destined for the Supra, came from the factory with sequential twin turbos. A smaller turbo spooled quickly for low end response, then a larger turbo took over at 4,000 RPM for top end power. The system was complex, with vacuum lines controlling butterfly valves that rooted exhaust gases. It made 276 horsepower officially, Japan's gentleman's agreement limit. But everyone knew this was a lie. Dyno tests showed 320 horsepower at the crank, with boost restricted to just 11.6 PSI. 
the fuel system revealed Toyota's true intentions. They fitted 400 or 3C fuel injectors, massive for a 276 horsepower engine. The fuel pump could support 500 horsepower. The intercooler was sized for twice the airflow the stock turbos could provide. It was like Toyota was winking at Tuner saying, we know what you're going to do with this. And boy, did Tuners take the hint. The first modification was always the same. Remove the sequential turbo system and install a single large turbo. This simplified everything and unlocked the engine's potential. With just a bigger turbo, fuel tuning and exhaust, the stock internals would happily make 500 wheel horsepower. Not crank horsepower and wheel horsepower, that's about 600 at the crank on stock internals. With the original head gasket, but that was just the beginning. Turn up the boost to 20 PSI, upgrade the fuel system, add aftermarket engine management, and 700 wheel horsepower was routine. The stock bottom end would take it, the stock head gasket would hold. The stock valve springs were good to 8,000 RPM. This was unheard of. Most engines making this power needed forged pistons, upgraded rods, head studs, metal head gaskets, valve spring upgrades, thousands in internal modifications. The 2JZ just needed boost and fuel. The tuning community went insane. Here was an engine that could make supercar power for the price of a turbo kit. Shops started pushing harder. 800 horsepower. 900. Some lunatics were hitting 1,000 wheel horsepower on stock internals with just head studs for insurance. The engines would take it. Day after day, pass after pass. The 2JZ refused to break. Think about that for a second. The engineering safety margin Toyota built in was so massive that the engine could handle 3.6 times its rated output on factory parts. That's like designing a bridge for 10-ton trucks and having it support 36-ton tanks. It defied logic. It defied physics. It definitely defied Toyota's accounting department when they saw the production cost. The 2 Jesus's strength came from a perfect storm of over-engineering. The iron block could handle cylinder pressures that would crack aluminum. The thick cylinder walls resisted bore flex under boost. The seven main bearings distributed load across the entire crankshaft. The closed deck design prevented the cylinders from moving under extreme pressure. The forged rotating assembly was built for diesel-like durability. Every single component was stronger than necessary. But here's what made the 2JZ truly special. Oil control. Toyota's engineers understood that oil is what keeps engines alive under stress. The 2JZ had piston oil squirters, keeping the pistons cool under boost. The oil pump was oversized with a deep sump that held 6.5 quarts. Oil galleries were drilled larger than normal for better flow. The oil filter housing had a built-in oil cooler. Even the PCV system was overbuilt to handle increased crankcase pressure from boost. The cooling system was equally robust. The water pump flowed 30% more than comparable engines. The radiator was sized for a V8. The thermostat opened at 82 degrees Celsius, keeping the engine cool under load. The head gasket had enlarged water passages between cylinders. Everything was designed to manage heat, the enemy of forced induction. So what was actually going wrong when these engines did fail? At extreme power levels, we're talking 10 on 200 plus wheel horsepower. The stock rods would finally bend, not break, not just bend slightly, causing piston to valve contact. The stock pistons would crack at the ring lands around 1,000 horsepower. If the tuning was aggressive, the head gasket might lift at 35 PSI a boost if you didn't upgrade the head studs. These weren't design flaws. These were the absolute limits of material science. The aftermarket responded with solutions that turned the 2JZ into something truly frightening. Forged pistons and rods could handle 2,000 horsepower. Billet blocks could take 3,000. Shops were building 2JZ engines, making power numbers that belonged on top fuel dragsters. The architecture was so fundamentally sound that it just scaled up infinitely. Let me put that in perspective. A Bugatti Veyron's Quad Turbo W16 makes 1,001 horsepower from 8.0 liters. That's 125 horsepower per liter. A built 2JZ making 2,000 horsepower from 3.0 liters is making 666 horsepower per liter. With two fewer turbos, from an engine designed in 1989, the 2JZ's transformed car culture. In Japan, 
It powered the Midnight Club's 200 Mimier highway runs. Smokey Nagata used one to break 200 Mimier on British public roads, becoming a legend and a fugitive simultaneously. In America, it dominated import drag racing. The first front-wheel drive car in the seven-second quarter-mile range, 2JZ powered the fastest Supra in the world, 2JZ making 3,000 horsepower, running six-second quarters at 240 in a year. But the real impact was on the streets. The 2JZ democratized speed before. If you wanted a 700 horsepower street car, you needed deep pockets or extensive mechanical knowledge. The 2JZ changed that. Buy a used Supra or SC300 bolt on a turbo kit. Tune it at any performance shop. Suddenly, you're hunting Ferraris on the highway. The barrier to entry for serious speed dropped to the price of a used Lexus and a credit card. <laughs> this accessibility created problems. Insurance companies started refusing to cover Supras. Police departments received special training on identifying modified 2JZ cars. Street racing incidents skyrocketed. The engine was too capable for its own good. It enabled speeds that drivers weren't prepared for and streets weren't designed for. The 2JZ also changed how engines were designed. Engineers worldwide studied Toyota's approach. Why was it so strong? How did they achieve such margins? The answer was simple, but expensive, no compromises. Every component was designed for worst case scenarios. Every tolerance was tighter than necessary. Every material was premium grade. Toyota spent V8 money building an inline six. Modern manufacturers learned the wrong lesson. They saw the cost and said, never again. Today's turbocharged engines are designed to make their rated power and not much more. They use aluminum blocks for weight savings. They use cast internals for cost savings. They minimize material everywhere possible. A modern BMW B58 inline six is a brilliant engine but it'll never take the abuse a 2JZ could. The market noticed. 2JZ engines became more valuable outside of cars than in them. Shops would buy entire Supras just to harvest the engine. Prices skyrocketed. A good used 2JZ long block now costs $8,000, $12,000. A built 2JZ capable of 1,500 horsepower runs, $30,000, $50,000. Complete Supra turbos are six-figure cars. The engine's reputation has literally priced itself out of existence. But wait, there's more. The 2JZ found its way into everything. Drift cars loved its torque and reliability. Time attack cars used its power and cooling capacity. Drag racers pushed it to the absolute limit. People swapped 2JZs into BMWs, 240 sacks, Mustangs, even pickup trucks. If it had an engine bay, someone put a 2JZ in it. The engine's influence extended beyond cars. The 2JZ proved that over-engineering could create legend status. It showed that reliability and performance weren't mutually exclusive. It demonstrated that giving enthusiasts headroom to modify was smart business. Every turbocharged performance engine since has been compared to the 2Z, most fall short. Toyota knew they'd created something special. When developing the Supra's successor, the A90, they <laughs> partnered with BMW rather than try to recreate the 2JZ. The development costs would have been astronomical. Environmental regulations would have neutered it. The business case didn't exist. The 2JZ was a product of its time. Unlimited budgets, minimal regulations, and engineering pride over profit margins. The human cost of the 2JZ's capability can't be ignored. This engine enabled speeds that claimed lives. Young drivers with more horsepower than experience wrapped Supras around trees, into walls, into other cars. Street racing incidents involving 2JZ-powered cars made headlines worldwide. The engine's accessibility to power became its dark legacy, yet the engineering achievement remains undeniable. Toyota's engineers created something that transcended its original purpose. They didn't just build an engine, they built a platform for dreams. Every kid who watched The Fast and the Furious wanted a 2JZ. Every tuner shop had 2JZ build recipes. Every drag strip saw 2JZ development pushing boundaries. The 2JZ represents peak automotive engineering in many ways. 
Not peak efficiency, modern engines are far more efficient. Not peak power density, Formula One engines make more power per liter. But peak over-engineering, peak reliability under extreme modification, peak potential for the price. No engine before or since has offered so much capability for so little money. Consider the engineering philosophy that created it. Toyota's engineers didn't ask how little can we use and they asked how much can we give. Every decision prioritized strength over cost. Every component was specified for extreme use. Every system was designed with massive safety margins. This philosophy is extinct in modern automotive engineering. The 2J's successor, BMW's Beep They Hate in the new Supra, is a fine engine. It makes more power stock, responds well to modification, uses less fuel, but it'll never achieve 2JZ status. It's built to modern standards, exactly strong enough, exactly capable enough, exactly profitable enough. It lacks the beautiful excess that made the 2JZ legendary. The last factory 2JZ rolled off the production line in 2007, ending an 18-year run. Toyota built approximately 400,000 2JZ engines across all variants. Today, finding an unmolested low-mileage example is like finding buried treasure. They're rebuilt, passed down, hoarded. They're mechanical heirlooms in a disposable world. The 2JZ proved that sometimes dangerous things become legendary precisely because they're dangerous. It gave ordinary people extraordinary power. It turned econoboxes into supercars. It made Toyota billions in warranty claims they never had to pay because the engine simply wouldn't break. It created widows, heroes, and legends in equal measure. This engine changed lives. It launched careers for tuners who mastered its potential. It bankrupted enthusiasts who chased its limits. It created millionaires who built businesses around its capability. It killed drivers who underestimated its power. The 2JZ wasn't just an engine, it was a cultural phenomenon that happened to be made of iron and aluminum. Modern emissions regulations mean we'll never see another 2JZ. Engineering like this is now illegal in most markets. The combination of massive displacement, turbocharging, and overbuilding doesn't meet efficiency standards. The 2JZ exists as a reminder of what's possible when engineers are told to build the best, not the most profitable. So here we are decades later still talking about an engine Toyota designed to sell luxury coupes to middle-aged executives. Instead, they created the most dangerous engine ever built. Dangerous because it was too good. Dangerous because it enabled too much. Dangerous because it refused to break when every other engine would have exploded into shrapnel. The 2JZ didn't just raise the bar for engine design, it launched the bar into orbit where it remains untouched. Every performance engine since lives in its shadow. Every tuner measures their builds against its standards. Every enthusiast dreams of its potential. The 2JZ isn't just the most dangerous engine ever built. It's the last of its kind, a monument to what happens when engineers are allowed to build without compromise. What modern engine do you think comes closest to the 2JZ's legendary status? Let me know in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this deep dive into engineering excellence, make sure to subscribe. We're just scratching the surface of automotive history's greatest power plants. Until next time, keep those turbos spooled.